I'm in New York City on a beautiful summer's morning. I'm in Central Park, which is arguably the most loved, most used, and most cosmopolitan piece of public urban space in the world. It's 836 acres, 250 are lawns, 150 is underwater, ponds, lakes, etc. And there's 80 acres of woodlands. The locals I speak to say that Central Park has never been in such fine shape, which is in sharp contrast to the state of the US economy. The US economy, it's nothing new to say that it's running twin deficits, the budget deficit and the current account deficit. And what about the 17 trillion of national public debt? It's almost 17 trillion anyway, it doesn't matter. What's a trillion here and there between friends? And the US Federal Reserve? Well, the US Federal Reserve has a massively expanding balance sheet, a balance sheet that is laden with the debt of its own country. Does it all matter? While the US is the world's biggest economy and while it controls the printing presses, probably not, but we're going to find out. In November 2008, just a few months after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, the US Federal Reserve introduced QE1, the first in what became a series of quantitative easing programs. It involved the Fed spending 100 billion US dollars per month to purchase mortgage-backed securities. It lasted 17 months, with a total spend of 1.7 trillion US dollars. In November 2010, the Fed introduced QE2, which lasted seven months, with 85 billion US dollars spent on US treasuries per month. A year after QE2 concluded, the Fed went even further by introducing, yes, you've guessed it, QE3. In a move seen by many as controversial, this program included a clause stating that a further purchasing of mortgage-backed securities and treasuries would go indefinitely, with no limit to purchases. The degree of spending remained static at 85 billion US dollars per month. Quantitative easing ran in tandem with Operation Twist, and quite aptly named, this introduced a different dynamic. Short-term treasuries were sold by the Fed, the proceeds of which were used to buy up longer-term securities. In January 2013, changes were made to qe 3 structure, evolving it into what's now commonly referred to as QE4. Operation Twist had come to an end by this time. The Fed was to target the unemployment rate directly. QE4 would continue until this rate fell below 6.5% or until core inflation rose to 2.5%. Over the next hour, we're going to talk to business leaders, to economists, to traders, to ex-traders, to academics, maybe even try and find a politician or two, who knows. But we're going to try and find out if money grows on trees. In Central Park, as you can see, quite a lot of trees. In fact, there's 24,000 of them. 1,700 of them are American elms, and they're looking particularly fantastic at this time of year. But there's no money trees. They're elsewhere. Let's find out if money really does grow on trees. Government monetary policy occasionally used to increase the money supply by buying government securities or other securities from the market. Quantitative easing increases the money supply by flooding financial institutions with capital in an effort to promote increased lending and liquidity. Trying to understand quantitative easing seems simple enough on the surface, but scratch a little deeper and you'll find a slew of different opinions with some for it, some against it, and some who just sit on the fence. Louis Alexander, most recently at the US Treasury Department, where he was counselor to the Secretary of the Treasury and a few years earlier worked as a senior economist at the Board of Governors of the US Federal Reserve and at the US Department of Commerce. He's currently the chief economist at Nomura. We begin our search for the big truth on quantitative easing at his offices in New York. Lewis, there's quite a few misconceptions about quantitative easing, QE as it's called. Is it really the printing of money? No, I wouldn't say it is. Actually, it's purchasing assets, and that has the effect of creating excess reserves on bank balance sheets, and in some ways of accounting for it, that is a form of money. But it, I don't believe it's generating inflation. I think it's primarily acting through the risk appetite of private investors. 